right, Inappropriate Earl, we're back. We're really cranking out those episodes again, trying to uh, get back into the Apple Podcast charts after I was wrongly accused of a music crime. <laughs> uh, I mean, for God's sakes, I only used one fucking song in five years. Uh, if it took them five years to catch on, it, that's another <laughs> podcast. Uh, today is a fun episode because you can know someone in the comedy scene but not know them. Like You can really see them. I've seen this dude 10 years, uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, I mean, not here in L.A., but in general, yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> Just, you know, L.A. and New York comics, we're all yeah. the same. Uh, and then uh, I did Tom uh, Segura and Christina Pazitsky's Your Mom's House podcast, and he is uh, part of that. Yeah. And I was like, oh, you like, because you had a wrestling shirt on. I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, you and know. we were doing the whole wrestling show. We had you in as an expert. Oh, and uh, You know you're in big trouble when I'm being <laughs> brought in as an expert. Uh, Josh Potter, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you. No, you brought something to the table that really opened Tom's eyes. He enjoyed... Uh, you discussing all the problematic characters that the WWE and WWF and the other territories had. So that was another element that other people didn't bring to the table. So Well, it really, I felt bad because it, it, it really had nothing to do with what I think you guys were having us come no, up No, it was for. actually the best the best thing you could have talked about, I think. Because uh, I know uh, he got into trouble. <laughs> yeah. Um, was wrestling pants who are a fervent bunch. Uh, basically saying it's fake. And uh, I think he had me, Tom, uh, no, me, Tony, Ron, and Steve Simone. Right. Kind of make our sales pitch. Yeah. And then we shot that, uh, the promo, and the wrestling community actually was like, oh, okay. And, but there were a couple of people that were still like clutching their pearls about it. Well, I'm just, I've always been fascinated by wrestling. Uh, Cause how old are you? I'm 34. Okay, so I'm 51. So I, I come from, uh, you know, the era where, like I said on the pod, where I, I thought it was real. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was no uh, internet, there's no Wikipedia page. Right. Uh, you know, so I really did think Kamala was from Uganda, Abdullah the Butcher from the Sudan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because when it, you, your age usually comes on with the attitude era. That was where I was. Totally, I was like 12, 13 years old during Attitude Era. Uh, 90, actually, 11 through, because it started around 97. I was 11 through like 14 when the Attitude Era was like in its prime. So I still kind of thought it was real because it was that blurred line like, oh my God, Vince McMahon is admitting he's the owner now and he's not the just the announcer anymore. And, you know, there was like little things that they would point to behind the scenes that they didn't do, you know, in 95, 96 in those times, you know, so the attitude era, it was kind of like, is this real? Like, you know, there were little parts of it. Obviously there were craziness, like with the undertaker and stuff and him doing like demonic ceremonies with Stephanie McMahon or whatever that you were like, okay, this is, <laughs> this isn't real, but it's fun. You know? I mean, yeah, I didn't mind like the stuff like Mark Henry being, uh, uh, alluded to having sex with an 85 year old woman in, uh, <laughs> may young may young yeah uh you know and then they did the it's probably my favorite sketch other than the billy and chuck gay wedding uh where they uh, have may young is having a baby at the age of like 87 <laughs> yeah. which is a little unbelievable and then the doctor and pat patterson and we'll get into him <laughs> oh in a yeah second uh are like, oh my god, and the guy reaches in and pulls out a hand. It's like, oh, <laughs> this is, you guys are going for the it, well, it got wild for sure. And it was a lot of like when you're a kid and you see like Sable's tits with like the handprints on them and shit, you're like, this is like the most hardcore stuff on television, you know what I mean? Like, well, I think that, like, and this goes to Eric Bischoff, who I was actually lucky enough to have on this podcast oh wow uh, i've never been so starstruck in my life i just kept staring at him for he's an intense hours. guy uh he was great uh i i you know i ask a lot of celebrities you know to come on and most say no to be honest and uh but he was like yeah i'll come on and uh and for, i had him for two and a half hours and i've told this story before and then i thought okay i'm a comic i want to go for it I said hey i got an idea for you about hulk hogan and he, you know, he's sitting right where you are and he gets on the edge of the sea because you can tell his creative mind is like, well, let's hear it. 
It's like, you know, I know he had some problems saying the N word and automatically you could see him kind of retreating. Like, yeah. oh, here it comes. Like, well, you know, you have him do a Royal Rumble with every black wrestler on the roster. And of course they're late. So they come out every three and a half minutes <laughs> and then you could see him go, come on, dude. And like, and they all whip him and they put him in chains, and, <laughs> you know, like, uh, viscera. I think he was still, alive. Yeah. uh, you know, he'll come out with cotton and he'll have to pick it from viscera. <laughs> and then he just looks at me and goes, and then what? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. I, that's about as far as I got with it. And, and then he's redeemed. <laughs> then he was, yeah. I was like, you know, get it. You know, it, it's wrestling. Like the people right. will go, okay. He said the N word. It was wrong. Now we're going to make him pay for it. Yeah, we're going to embarrass him into redemption. And then Eric Bischoff was like, hey, dude, I got to go. So, uh, <laughs> But you pitched it, though, at least. Uh, you know, I went for I it. thought you were about to tell me that you were the reason he went heel in NWO. I wasn't sure how long ago this was. You were like, I got an idea for Hogan. Uh, well, what if? <laughs> it's still That was wrestling 9-11. Uh, I know. You it know was, if you think about it. Like, it was. It kind of tore it all away. Well, that was like the last, to me, great storyline where they really took their time. You know, first Hall comes in in that jobber match. Uh, and then, you know, I think it was like a week later, Nash came in. And then it was just like a month or two. Yeah, they were coming out of the, the outsiders. They were coming out of the crowd. I was a WWF guy purely. So when they went over there, I was like, what's Diesel doing on WCW? And then his name was just Kevin Nash. I'm like, I don't like that. But WCW right. was always that. It was always like guys with regular names, kind of. They didn't really have the gimmicks. And when I was a kid, I was all about the gimmicks, you know? That, that was the exciting part. Oh, sure. As a child. And then you grow up and you're like, oh, this is way cooler. But yeah, when they first went over there, I was like, they're traitors or whatever. I didn't watch it, but you'd hear things. But that Hogan thing really was like, maybe I watched Nitro for a couple couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, it really, for two years, it, they yeah. beat uh, WWE. And they really fucked up the NWO, though, when they started just, like, making everyone a member of it. Yeah, it's kind of like Kiss, you know, Ace and Peter leaving, and then it's just a revolving door of musicians, and it's just not Kiss anymore. Well, it got to the point where it was like, there was no WCW left. They were just, it was like Ric Flair and Sting, and they were just getting fucked up and fucked even, over. Like fucking Sting, they had joined the NWO Red, right? Which is pack. The, the, yeah, that's uh, crazy. Which is like, yeah. And then there was like Latino w, uh, NWO yeah. or something, Eddie right? Guerrero, yeah. And, uh, I think Chavo Guerrero right. Jr. has been on this podcast too, uh, you know, and and he's uh, I think he has something to do with Dark Side of the Ring. Oh, okay. Uh, which is, which has uh, been fantastic. It really, uh, I I've pitched the writer, uh, one of the writers, Evan, producer writer you got to do an episode on racism and wrestling. Uh, yeah. You know, just like when I do. Makes uh, sense. Yeah. No, why not? Well, it's just like when I did your mom's house, it was like, look, look at some of these characters. Like they had Kamala, uh, you know, uh, Abdullah, the uh, angel, the gay wrestler, which it's not necessarily racist. I like guess just homophobic. Right. Uh, and uh, Virgil, I mean, is Virgil ra racist? Virgil has been on this podcast. That's what. That's awesome. Uh, I'm sure really. he was happy to talk to somebody. That's all, all I, I did mean. was uh, <laughs> talk about how big his dick was. You know, that's hilarious. At I, least he's got that. Because <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to ask him serious questions, right? Like, you know, what was it like being a black wrestler in the '80s? And he's like, "Man, I got a 14 inch dick, bro." <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> well, he's got to hold on to something because I hear he's not doing so hot at these autograph signings. So, oh, that one picture, Lonely Virgil. It, yeah, it's, it's like, sad, and it's real. Like, a lot yeah, of, you know, it's it, like the wrestler, the movie when they go into that yeah. scene, you know, and they're sitting at the card tables or whatever, and they haul out their shit out of their trunk and. I mean, I've it. been to those things, and uh, like, I go to a lot of, not a lot, but a few like action movie uh, conventions, like, not comic cons. Yeah, conventions. Uh, yeah, and uh, dude, it's so sad when you see like someone you're a fan of, and you know, I, I don't want to even say this guy's name because I'm such a fan, uh, but he was a bad guy in, in one of the 80s, you know, type of movies uh, with. Uh, I'll just say Stallone or Schwarz. <laughs> okay. And there was no one in line. And I went to talk to him and he literally talked to me for like 25 minutes. Uh, you know, he was like, I'll I got to talk to someone. Just this guy's good enough. And he told great stories and it was just like kind of sad. Like, yeah. Yeah. Then he packs up his posters and puts them in his yeah, car and shit. Like, it's like, ah, uh, uh, that blows. It's just like, and you know, those wrestlers are like, you know, you take, I'm trying to think other than Virgil, you take a guy like, 
I don't know, Horace Hogan. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, in WWE, like D'Lo Brown. D'Lo like, Brown. Uh, D'Lo playing? Brown, man, is he, do you think he, I mean, I've never heard him talk about this. Did they do a draws dark side of the ring yet? They, um, not a direct one. He's in it, I know. But they've had, well, he was in the. Um, the Road Warriors. And... He's in the Road Warriors one, and he was also in the uh, Brawl for it all. Yeah. I saw those uh, two. But I didn't know if they did one specifically on him, you know, how he came in as puke and then D'Lo Brown, you know, fucked him up. And I know D'Lo Brown has like tremendous remorse over that. Oh, you could. They've asked him. I forget what episode it was on. It might have been for the uh, brawl for it all Mm -hmm. episode. uh, And you could tell he's just still devastated. Yeah. And draws seems pretty like chill. Hey, man, it happened. He forgave him. Pretty, pretty like wholeheartedly i believe but it still probably fucks a guy up i mean you know he i mean watching him on tv he was never the same after that incident you know they he would try to go out there but he was never really the same wrestler he was second guessing himself a lot and which is why i almost wanted to come on the pod and kind of stick up for wrestling because it's like hey if it was fake man these guys wouldn't be getting hurt oh no yeah i mean Part of it is, a, you know, a ruse. I mean, I'm sitting there and I'm a fan and he knows I'm Tom knows I'm a fan uh, and I've expressed these feelings to him many a times. And I think that was part of the impetus of him degrading wrestling fans so hardcore. Well, they might but, be, uh, you know, like I'm a wrestling fan, like I'm a pretty big one, although I don't quite get the current. Uh, I, I've checked out in the last two, two, three years. Um, I've tried. I haven't, I would, I, I can't, you know, the AEW stuff intrigues me, but I haven't checked it out yet. And now I feel like they're picking up all the fat that was released from the WWE roster. So I'm like, well, I didn't want to watch these guys in the first place. That's you know? my point. Yeah. But I will say sometimes I'm wrong. Uh, sure. Like I love Brody Lee and AEW. Yeah. He's from uh, around my hometown, actually. Oh, okay. Luke Harper. Uh, it was yeah. his orig- other name. He's from Rochester, New York. Uh, he still lives in Webster, New York, like full time, which is crazy. My buddy, uh, Kenny Casanova, who is, uh, I guess you would say he's Kamala's, uh, business manager, uh, who I got the autograph picture from, uh, he sent me some photos of when he used to manage Luke Harper mm. when he had no beard. Right. It and looks it was, weird. Uh, and they were like in New York, Buffalo. Yeah. Like ESW. KC. Empire State Wrestling and all that. Yeah, and it was so weird to see him with like no facial hair. He looked like uh, Joey Fatone. <laughs> yeah, he he was like a pretty boy for a second there, kind of. Um, but like he's one where, and the WWF. I, I still have trouble calling them WWF. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was probably twentieth, maybe twenty to thirtieth on their roster in terms of importance. Right. But in AEW, he's he's like their top heel. I he, think he had like a couple of times where he would be rising and then something would happen an injury or like he would just get scuttled in a storyline like when he was in the bludgeon brothers that tag team was like something i would watch because it was now who him, was in that it was uh him and eric rowan who's great yeah He's and they're great. and they're powerful and they're also graceful like they the combination of power and like athleticism with between those two guys and the way that they work together they were the most epic tag team at that time and they won the belt they were like undefeated for a while and then i don't know what happened they just blew them up i don't understand sometimes uh like why they ruin like bray wyatt to me is like another he's yeah in that group. they keep throwing him in the well he like came out of the gate so hot and i was that's what actually helped get me back into it there for a second was his character and you know he was like the eater of worlds and stuff but then it got to be like where is this going? Like there was no end to, you know what I'm saying? Like the story just didn't go anywhere for him. And I'm like, well, what is he? Is he a God? What, you know, like let's well, see something here. That's why I think they should hire guys like you and me, uh, who are fans, write. but we were comics or we have comic minds. Yeah. Uh, so we get like kind of the humorous route they want to take now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we'll also like, I, would love to have pitched them a storyline for Sting that I think would have killed certainly much better than them, like just em- like embarrassing him. Yeah, it was sad. Uh, it, yeah, it was like <laughs> the Undertaker makes me sad too right now. Not to 
go well, on a tangent. They might do Sting and The Undertaker next year. That will be so sad to watch. But yeah, it's just too late. Yeah, it's over. Undertaker makes me, when he comes out, he takes a thousand years to get to the ring, and then the match ends quicker than it takes him to get to the fucking ring. Well, that was, that, that Sting Triple H match was so sad on so many different levels. And disrespectful. Disrespect beyond, like, he should have never fought Triple H. Right. Like, it made no sense. It was a stroke job for Triple H. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, like, my storyline, if I would have pitched it, and I don't think I'll ever be in a position again, uh, is you have Randy Orton mm. do the legend killer thing, and he's cutting a promo. I beat Hogan. I beat Austin. I beat The Rock, and just go on and on because yeah. he's beating Flair. everybody. Yeah, everybody. Flair. Uh, you know, my dad's a legend. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I beat uh, just every wrestler basically on the roster. And then Sting comes down from the rafters and goes, you didn't beat me. And, you know, it's a little, you know, short program. And, yeah. Like, you have him job. He jobs to Sting. But it's a good match. And it gives St Sting a little boost. before. Yeah. yeah. And then every kid in that arena is like, who's this guy in makeup? I want his T-shirt. Yeah. Yeah fake mask that i have one over there uh, I, can't believe <laughs> I wish he when he came back he was like he came back as like 80s thing see i well you know he's got some hairline issues oh okay <laughs> I, I don't that, that was, doesn't stop the undertaker <laughs> but it looks cool i'll get see they take care of the undertaker yeah, though, yeah. because in every hairstyle he has like now i think he's it's kind of like like not greased back, but like it, it. They should have stuck with like the buzz though that he had. Go, remember he had that like demonic mohawk. Right, that looked yeah, a little that better. Looks good. I like his look now. I mean, you could tell he's balding, but like yeah. it, it's like that almost Gene Hackman like. Type yeah, of slicked hairline. back. You know, Gordon Gecko. Yeah, uh, but with Sting, he, he had some hairline issues uh, that. I, I can't believe WWE. If that was a WWE wrestler, they would have said, "Hey, we gotta patch that up." Uh, you know, there's that toxic or a tonic or that hairspray. Yeah, the like thing that makes it blend in. Yeah, I mean, I know a big name comic who used to use that before they All hit the, the stage, and it looks perfect. Yeah. Uh, now, so you know, they they just buried the fucking guy. They did, it, you know, and I feel like it was one of those things. Like they always wanted to do that. It was oh, like absolutely. their final brick on destroying wcw was the final thing was sting beating but, sting yeah because he was the only guy he never, never came over. over nope even when they sold yeah so he was like i'll go to tna i'm i'm you know in my 40s at that time yeah i don't want to like travel and I, I he strikes me as the type of guy who saved his money yeah <laughs> one of the very few <laughs> sure. from his era you know, Flair's broke. Flair always was broke. Yeah, because he's got to ride in a limo everywhere and a jet everywhere. I got to show you the the cameo he did for my friend Greg. Oh, my like, God. That's so funny. I was happy for Greg because he's a big wrestler. He's like us. Oh, but oh. you saw the one we, we, we got for. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I felt a little bad manipulating him to say things that we no, wanted him to say, but he killed it. He, what, he what really it, killed 500? it. 500? Yeah, it was 500 bucks. bucks. It's, yeah, it's, like, it. it's like who gives it? Yeah. What's he going to say? I've reached out to Kamala to do one, but he's not technically. I, I don't believe I'll be getting a, a cameo. <laughs> I, I would give him five hundred. Yeah, uh, but you know, going back to Sting, like what was even sadder than the match was the fucking run-ins, which uh -huh. were basic. They they weren't run-ins, like, right? <laughs> it, all seven guys from DX and NWO like needed walkers. Oh my god, it was terrible. The whole thing was like a schmoz that wasn't supposed to be a schmoz. It was yeah. like it was like a parody. I seeing Kevin poor like seeing Kevin Nash and Scott Hall try to do stuff is like really sad. I mean, obviously Scott Hall has that famous like when he was on pills and shit, and he looks great compared to then, obviously, and he's recovered. But still, I don't need to see him wrestle. You know what I mean? Like he was so great. That's what I don't understand why they just drive these guys into the ground, or is it the guys that want to drive themselves into the ground? Probably both. You know, you never, like the Undertaker can't do eighty percent of the things that he used to be able to do, and he's very old. I mean, I don't want. It makes me sad to watch him now because he'll never be. It's not like we're getting one last Undertaker match. We're getting like what he is now. It's, it's but like I, I will say like Sting and the Undertaker. Like I don't want to see it, 
but I think it would be a decent match because they both move at the same pace. So, it would but almost, it's so slow though that like I feel like, like I'll give Triple H and, and Sting this. Like the match was actually pretty good. Yeah, because they're both like Triple H has he's had his quad torn. Yeah, from he's his, got mechanical knees basically. Uh, Sting is you know just thirty years in the business moves around pretty slow. So I liked the actual match. Yeah. But then the run in, like the NWO coming in to save Sting made no sense because they never were aligned. Yeah, that's why I, he was always against NWO. Yeah, so it's like. I don't like, yeah, that's I didn't like that either. And then when DX came out, I mean, I get the nostalgia of having NWO take on basically the WWE. But it would be different if it was like Kevin Nash versus Triple H and then that run in happened. Do you know what I mean? Like Sting yeah. wasn't the leader of. NWO at any point. He was never associated with the black and white ever. Right. Not even for a day. No. And then you see uh, Kevin Nash and uh, Shawn Michaels going at it in, in the run-in part. It's like, well, you just inducted him into the Hall of Fame last night. Yeah, we know your friends. So, now, I realize I'm probably overanalyzing. A no, fame. no, not at all. I mean, it it just takes you out of it because you're like... It's like the click thing all over again, only like that was cool because you were like, wait, what? Right. And in this case, you were like, I already know their friends, so this isn't really like a work for me. It's not jiving for me. Now they have to create like multi-layered storylines to make you think like, do these people like actually hate each other or not? And if they don't do that, they don't put that effort forth. There's nothing to it then. It's like, I don't really give a shit. Yeah. Know? Like I would have had like. You want to do a run in, which I don't think the match needed. Which side was X Pac on, by the way, during that? Was, I don't remember. Uh, well, yeah, that's another thing. I he was think in both DX because he was in. He was like in. He was like the only guy that was in both legitimately. If I'm not mistaken, he and I might be wrong. Uh, I want to say he came out with DX. That would make sense. He was in DX longer, and he did that whole. That was a big moment. It wasn't quite Hogan, but when he showed up on raw and was like in dx and like basically told wcw to, to suck it yeah. like that was cool that was fun yeah i like stuff like that like uh but i don't know like, i like i would have i wouldn't have minded if it was just Shawn michaels who came out yeah me too because then you, you've never I, to my knowledge Shawn michaels and sting have never been in the same ring that would have been an amazing like, okay yeah you know and the way they did his super kick i did like because you mm -hmm. at least if you're watching on tv you didn't see Shawn Michaels in the ring, and then all of a sudden, but uh, you know, I just think the writing's just so bad. Oh, it's uh, it's not great. You know, Freddie Prince Jr. used to write for them, but and he's a fan. Yeah, yeah, and he did a good job. I mean, during his time, he did a, did a pretty good job. You know, well, I, I think know. there's so many yes men around. Uh, I'll assume Triple H and and uh, Shane McMahon and, and yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm assuming Vince at this point is pretty isolated from writers. Yeah, he. I think he gets his fingers in a little too much still, from what I understand. Like yeah, and the, what are you going to do? You're going to argue with him about right. a storyline, but it's like, dude, this is, you guys will actually make more money if, and I keep going back to Sting, but that, that storyline was so fucking butchered. Right. Like, you know, when you had Triple H beat him, you think one kid wanted Sting's t-shirt the next day? Nope. Who's this old guy in makeup? Exactly. And then they had him in a fucking segment on Monday Night Raw off air with Bo Dallas. Like who? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, what the fuck? So That's a guy who got buried too, Jesus. Uh, yeah, he got buried. I mean, I do like AEW. Uh I, I can't call him Jake. Is he but. on AEW now? I didn't even realize. No, I mean I thought he was uh but he'd be like, no, I, I don't think he's in AEW now, but he's a guy they would probably go after. So, yeah. Dude, I didn't like you said. I never knew why he wouldn't just like because the you know obviously he's a rotundo or whatever he he's part of that family. Oh, I love Mike Rotundo. He it's like get with your brother Bray, dude. Like do be, he they should have put Bo in the in the cult or whatever the hell that was too. You know, I mean, just to give him some heat. It's his brother. You know, play up that angle, give him some heat. But he never really got a fair dude. He did that believe shit for a little while. That was kind of cool. And then he just dropped off the face. He was then he became comic relief, and it wasn't funny. And he just kind of dropped off the face of the earth yeah he was kind of like given the carlito treatment of, right you know carlito was a good wrestler sure and then they are oh, you're gonna spit the apple in someone's face <laughs> like 
you know, that ain't cool. Uh, I was telling Tom this in 2002, I was like 16 and I saw on, you know, the internet was kind of new and I saw on the WWE website in like the career section that they were hiring writers and I just wrote a packet and then I emailed it to like the basic address on the website and someone actually wrote back to me. They're like, oh, this is actually the email you, you write it to. So then I sent it to that email and they wrote back to me and they were like, are you in a, in the union, blah, blah, blah. Like who represents you? Like you just sent this packet. I was like, I'm 16 years old. <laughs> and they were like, <laughs> they were like, oh, well that's, you, you know, we hire TV writers and, uh, send them to Pat Pat or something. The, yeah. They were like, come, <laughs> yeah, no, I, w- I mean, I would have taken that. I would have got the Wade Robson treatment. I'd be like the most prolific fucking wrestling writer ever. Well, but I, but it was nice of them to <laughs> respond and to, uh, you know, be like, you know, check back in a few years or something like that. They wrote, I couldn't believe they wrote back to me, but. I mean, I had a meeting once with Shane McMahon and, you know, I I could just tell, like, I wasn't right for the gig, but I took the meeting anyway. Yeah, of course. And, uh, he's like, well, tell us a storyline. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm, I'm old school, you know, like, bad guys cheating for most of the match. And then, you know. Uh, good guy uh or the face you know he just kind of powers up and and wins in the end and you know i gave him a couple examples of the wrestlers who were on the roster back then and he just looks at me and goes yeah we're not we're not really about that anymore like, <laughs> well what are you about yeah what, do you, what are you about and he said well you know our current storyline is uh it's uh triple h and kane and uh it's kind of like rocky two where uh you know uh Kane's playing the Rocky part. He doesn't want to fight Triple H like Apollo Creed, you know, in Rocky Two had to almost draw Rocky out of retirement. Right. And so we're having Triple H do all these things to antagonize. And I'm like, oh, okay. I mean, I like, what's the... It sounds like what you said, kind of, you know, the bad guy gets... Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, <laughs> it's what's like... the climax of this? He's like, well, we're going to have a... I'm going to have Triple H humping a dead body. And I'm like, well, what does that have to do with the storyline? He's like, oh, well, that, the girl was a, a drunk driving uh, victim for, of Kane's. And I'm like, and that's going to be the thing that gets Kane into the mix? Yeah, and right. I'm like, hey, man. I, Why I'm, is Kane driving, by the way? Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I'm not getting this uh, storyline at all, but thank you for the stake. I was God, like, why, they really fucked his, I mean, he was the big red machine. It's another guy. He was yeah. fucking incredible. It was like one of the best characters. And then they're like, let's lose all of it. And then he was still, somehow he was still amazing when they took the mask off and he was just the bald, like psycho cane. That was cool too. And then they did another variation with him where he was back in the thing and he had a voice box. I just, I'm like, why are they fucking this guy so much? He was incredible. Yeah. I don't, you know, it's almost like they're, they're, getting back at them for being bad people behind the scenes or something or Or they like are there so long and they're like we had they're just tried these things and it just fucks their legacy up to me like my alt the ultimate blasphemy to me was always american badass undertaker right that was it was like so fucking dumb it was you know america propaganda post 9 11 bullshit so you know, he comes out with a flag on his motorcycle to Kid Rock. And I'm like, what the, f- this isn't the fucking Undertaker, you know? That's right around the time when. The- that makes him human. I don't like him human. Yeah, I, d- I don't want to see him as like a Lorenzo Lamas renegade. Uh, yeah. Type character, you know, I like. He's the dead man. He's supposed to be yeah, like dead. The, the casket match with Kamala. Yeah, know? all the guy, Yokozuna casket match was amazing. Uh, but you know, Undertaker was also uh, a lot younger back then. So sure, sure. Uh, Even in the Attitude Era, he he was doing that like he never spoke, and he wasn't like you know wearing the hat with the gloves or anything and doing like the whole funeral home vibe. He was like the leader of this dark cult, you know. And he had Minion, who was um, I forget who he was before, but that's when Viscera came around. Who the fuck was Minion? He was somebody before he was Minion. I can't remember. Look that up. I'm the one. Yeah, it's it's, huh? it's something. It it wasn't the repo man, was it? It might have been. <laughs> no, I mean, there's so many uh, forgettable characters. Yeah, but like he might have been the repo. I'm I'm talking out my ass, but he definitely was someone bizarre. And then so it was like this group. I forget what they were called. The Ministry of and right. uh, that was a crazy fun storyline. And that was a, a variation of the Undertaker that 
I enjoyed quite a bit, you know, but then they fucking put him on a motorcycle after that. Well, I did uh, like the um, the storyline The Undertaker was in with Muhammad Hassan. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny yeah, too. Al Qaeda, like yeah, uh, yeah. That's when that poor said. fucking guy. What was he Italian? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was. It, I did like Davari though, the manager. Like, yeah, he was great. And I think that's why um, that guy got fucked because he got so much heat. Well, yeah, I can understand why. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That one, I think it was when they they didn't kidnap the Undertaker, but they knocked him out or whatever, and they, I think they carried him out, and they, he had. Like his ISIS like helpers, and it's like, oh, this might be. Yeah, it was like going, uh, they were doing like far. promos, kind of where it was like, is this a Daniel Pearl video or? Yeah, is this, yeah. It's like, <laughs> you know, I, like when Sergeant Slaughter was at the comedy store once, I, I said, hey man, when you did that uh, pro Iraqi sympathizer thing, is there any blowback from that? And he's like, yeah, man, I had to wear a bulletproof vest everywhere I went. Yeah, he said he would get like death threats and shit. Imagine that with Twitter. Was, yeah, I mean, that's like basically when people thought it was real. Still. <laughs> Imagine if people thought it was real and there was Twitter. The outrage. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The trolls would be yeah. out of control. It would be crazy if people thought it was real on Twitter. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, it's like when the Ultimate Warrior came back in WCW, like the internet ruined it for me. Cause yeah. It was in Buffalo yeah. that night. And some wrestling fan, I used to go on this website, lordsofpain.net. It was, it's like a dirt sheet site. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was. They had like the scoops and, you know, I was a lazy wrestling fan around that time. And some guy was like, yeah, I just saw the Ultimate Warrior at the Buffalo airport. Uh, he told me he's going to be on uh, Nitro tonight. I'm like, oh, fuck, man. I'm like, wow. That but blows. it ruined it. Yeah, like, it blows. The surprise. And then he did like a 30-minute speech. Uh, which really, you know, he was only supposed to do seven minutes. Yeah, so I do like him in that regard. He just said, yeah, because he was just Jaloon. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a half hour. He, um, when he came back to WWF and he wore the hat, and it was like so weird. He like had the picture and the hat. He just was dressed differently. It's like what do you? He had like a ponytail. Remember that? Well, I think he cut his hair. Well, oh, that was a Jerry Lawler. It was the Jerry Lawler uh, versus ultimate warrior thing wasn't it when he came back i don't you know he came back like three times in yeah WWE. jerry did. lawler did that that i loved watching jerry lawler in those late 90s matches because he was just you know he was obviously out of shape compared to his prime but he would do all the fucking heel gimmicks like he'd have the foreign weapons and he'd sell that shit so funny funnily like it was like he had a string one time he's choking him and the ref would be like what are you doing and he's like i'm not doing anything what are you talking about like that kind of shit he was so good at that oh yeah he was even like you said when he was older i think he still uh i don't know you know he didn't take a lot of bumps so i think his body held up sure a little better than you know say someone like uh you know, like a Sting or a Ric Flair. Yeah, who, Flair. You know, they took some serious bumps. And Flair with a broken back. Yeah, that's uh, crazy. Uh, you, you know, I think some wrestlers, you know, The Undertaker's never really taken a right. ton of crazy bumps. But, you know, you do wrestling for as long as he has. Or Yeah, eventually, you know, I mean, even like Hulk Hogan, you do the, you're just doing a leg drop for 40 years. That'll make your spine compounded in itself. You know what I mean? Well, he has like two hip replacements. Yeah. His arms are like longer than they like should be because his, he's actually like shorter than he used to be. Yeah. And Cause his, when I met him, I, I met him at WrestleMania. I, I, oh boy, it was the one at Staples center. And it was the one where Muhammad Hassan was beating up Eugene. <laughs> and Another like, banner character with the, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, oh, I think I brought him up on the podcast. Hey, yeah, this guy's playing an autistic, basically retarded character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, even Tom, I think, was like, no, nah, they wouldn't do that. And then you guys pulled up like yeah. 20 pictures of him. And uh, Hulk Hogan walked out for that. And I think in that same uh, WrestleMania, it was a Kurt Angle and uh, The Undertaker fought. And I was backstage because... Um, the my girlfriend at the time manages to this day motorhead oh that's awesome and they did triple h's song yeah it was so sad though to see like after their match 
the Undertaker and Kurt Angle hugged each other, and but like the Undertaker backstage, looked yeah. pretty rough. Yeah, like he was limping, and Ric yeah. Flair was limping. And... I saw the only WrestleMania I got to go to was Flair's retirement against uh, Shawn Michaels in the uh, Orange Bowl or Citrus Bowl, whatever it is in Florida and Orlando in 2007 and that that was a fucking incredible match and i'm so happy i got to be there for because like Shawn michaels it, it's like my one a is rick flair my one b is Shawn michaels so i mean that was like and i didn't even know that that was happening until or like i didn't even know i was going to that until like the last second i got to go i used to work in radio and they i got like a media pass and everything got to go down there got to go see rick flair go in the hall of fame there oh really yeah that was i saw his induction it was amazing I mean, that was a great match, uh, especially when, like, it started to well up when Sean... Oh, yeah, when he says, I'm sorry, and he kicks him. Him. Said, I'm sorry. <laughs> and while you're there, you don't see that necessarily, because, like, you know, you're in the crowd or whatever, so you don't see his face, but, like, then you see it, like, on the replay of the Jumbotron, you're like, oh, my God. But, like, the bumps that Flair took in that match, it was like he... I mean, of course, we know that he came back a thousand times after that, but it was like he was treating it like it's his last match, and he's like, "I'm going to take all the fucking bumps on this thing." Yeah, I mean, it was uh... it was rough. I was like, "He's old, and he's taking these fucking." He just went through a table, like through the broadcast table and shit. That's yeah. I mean, Michaels didn't really go easy on him. No, uh, he didn't want him to. I don't think either. And uh, I just hope he doesn't wrestle again in terms of a Ric Flair because. Oh, Ric Flair. I don't think Ric Flair can like walk very good these days, let alone wrestle. I mean, well, he, in that cameo video, not the one he did for you guys, but yeah, the one for he the looks right, which I think was probably last week. It's like, oh my God. I mean, I know we all age. The one he did for us, he didn't look great either. But I mean, you know, he almost died a few months ago or a year ago or two or whatever it was. He had that stroke and everyone's like, he's going to die. Made him quit drinking, thank God. But allegedly. Uh, allegedly, yeah. Well, that's the thing is like, People get surprised when pro wrestlers die. And it's like, dude, Roddy Piper, for example, was taking chair shots and, you know, ungodly stunts and, and bumps for 45 yeah. years, maybe longer. I have a theory about his early death, too, that I don't know if you can corroborate or not, because you guys knew him better than I did, obviously. I never met him. I listened to his podcast up until the end. I thought that was pretty fucked up what... Stone, Stone Cold, Cold did do him, yeah, I mean, but uh, I think and and I think that like that's that's going to go into my theory. By the way, he got so upset about that. I feel like he was a very angry person, and not like he had a kind heart. I know, and he was very kind to the people that he loved. But I think he held in anger a lot of times, and it like made his fucking heart explode or something. You know, I what believe I mean? that. I mean, I came in to his podcast like. Uh, a couple weeks after the Will Sasso impression of Austin. So I was a little... What a the... bitch Austin is for doing oh that, by God. the way. He blocked me on Twitter. I, three people have blocked me on Twitter. Him, uh, uh, who else? Bill Cosby, and uh, <laughs> Miramax Films. <so. laughs> well, those are two out of the three, at least we know. I mean... <laughs> but OJ has, has not blocked me. I've gone out of my way to get him to block me. <laughs> I don't think OJ reads Twitter. You know what I... You know what... Uh, quick tangent on oj i'm a big student of him oh i love him he Please. he uh i'm a big bills fan obviously he um he realized with twitter that he, he his charm doesn't come through in texting so he treats it like instagram he does a video every time hello twitter world because he's the most fucking charming man to ever exist he got an a jury to basically let him off of murder just being like I'm OJ, and they were like, "Yeah, let's you're you're not guilty." You know what I'm saying? Like, he's that fucking charming that he could do that. And now he goes on Twitter and does this. I have like friends who are feminists or whatever who loathe the idea of OJ. And then I remember one telling me that she was like, "You know, I watch OJ's videos, and he's really he's really nice sounding. It's weird." And I'm like, "Yeah, that's because he's fucking the most charming man to ever exist." Maybe he yeah. really is. I mean, I. I'm blown away that he didn't get convicted. Like unbelievable, yeah. Because to me, it never, you know, the whole the glove, it didn't fit. It's like you can still kill someone if the gloves. <laughs> yeah, aren't and exactly that whole 
ruse of him putting on like, Ooh, I don't know if I can get it on. It wasn't like he was really trying to put like, you know, I know you were in Norbert and shit, but you had a hard time acting that. I mean, he was doing a terrible acting job trying to like pretend that glove wasn't going on his hand. Well, apparently he didn't take his arthritis medicine that day on purpose. Winky face. Yeah, that was what they they said to him, like, maybe don't take your heart medication or whatever it was because it makes your hands swell up. And uh, I mean, I remember even I wasn't a kid. I was at 94. So I was, uh, you know, 25 ish. And he started faking like they were tough to put on. I'm like, oh, man, this is going to lose him the trial. <laughs> yeah, you thought that was good. Yeah, because you were like, clearly he's trying really hard to make it pretend like this doesn't fit him. But like, even and he had that he, face. He'd be like, oh, yeah, he's like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Huh? And then, uh, and you could just tell the look on the defense team was like, yes. Uh, and it also didn't help that Mark Furman basically recorded a rap record on that one tape. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, that's I love making that tape uh, public knowledge. Yeah. Uh, F. Lee Bailey just constantly saying the N word. And it worked. <laughs> yeah. Because it was so like, is this old white guy crazy? But, it, and then they start the tape and he's saying it and like, wow. And Mark Furman still got a TV job. I know on Fox. Yeah. Uh, I think he was doing uh, the Saturday afternoon. Uh, they didn't give him a great time slot. Uh, <laughs> like Saturday, right before uh, Oliver North's uh, gun collection show or, you know, but it, like it like to me it's like what normal black or white and certainly in the world we're living in now it's, oh yeah but what human would think that oj didn't do those two murders of course yeah like even if you're there, you hate white people or you're the most pro-black supporter on earth it's like come on man. oh yeah i mean even uh you know people who are like just pro black supporter or whatever. They're like, we're happy he got off because one of us got off. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, I don't blame him. And from the, you know, so yeah, that, I mean, and that's fine. I, I, I like that too. I'm like, that's, and for me, I'm like, I don't care that he fucking got off really either. I mean, I'm not going to be outraged by it. It's, I mean, the judicial system doesn't get things right all the time. I mean, I mean, that's why this just was a high profile version of it. You know, with what's going on now with those four cops. Yeah. Dude, I, th- I, you know what my fear is with that shit? Not to like devolve into that, but no, they're well, going to get the whole point of this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I guess devolve. you're right. They're going to get fucking, uh, I think the they're, they're going to end up acquitting the guy and then the world will burn. They can't. They, they ha- I mean, they have to, they right? They have to. I'm seeing weird shit though, where they're like showing different things where they're like, this is the defense, blah, blah, blah. This is what they're going to use. I'm. I'm nervous about it. Like, oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I you know, the defense is going to be uh, for the main guy. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's how I'm trained. Like, it's not my fault. And then the other three are going to be like, uh, that's how we're trained. Like, we yeah. Don't. And I, I saw a thing like uh, the autopsy was like, it's not necessarily asphyxiation that killed like, the man. On, man. That's what I mean. Like, that's what they said, and that's what they're going to use. Like inconclusive evidence i fucking really scared they're gonna quit this guy i mean i don't know i think the main guy will get life or, or whatever the, the most severe penalty he can yeah. get i think the other three unfortunately will probably get 10 years or something and that accessories uh, uh, yeah i don't know what just the fact that they didn't stop it but, yeah uh but I can. I already heard one report of a defense attorney saying, "Well, I think he had coronavirus, and that's how he died." And no, he was being completely. No, serious. I know, I know. Like, I heard that. Oh one boy, too. cue the riots. Yeah. Uh, just when I, we were, uh, all my stores were going to open up again. Oh uh, my god, they're supposed to open this today, and there, I, I, a bunch of my favorites are like, we're going to delay a week, actually. I mean, uh, it's tough. Like, I was excited. John Varvados might be opening up today. You know, I'm a Varvados man. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, there's bigger problems in the world than Barbados yeah, delaying yeah, their, yeah. Uh, you know, release. But, uh, I mean, that was pretty wild to see last week. Where were you last weekend? Um, I was at, on uh, the first night of the curfew. I didn't know what was going on. Who I, did, bro? And on Saturday night, I, I walked to Birds over in West Hollywood to get, like, a to-go margarita. And then I was going to, like drink the margarita and take a Xanax and just take the 40 minute walk home and just float and go to bed or something. Cause that's quarantine. I was like, whatever. But, uh, this girl called me and she lives like 
off of Hollywood Boulevard. I'm like, oh, that's kind of on the way back. Yeah. So I went there at like 6.30, hung out there until, well, like we, were, we, we hung out and fell asleep. I woke up and it was 10.30 and I'm like, I better go catch the subway. You know, I got to get home for the subway. The subway goes till two, but you know, I told her, I'm like, I better get out of here. So I go to the Hollywood and Highland subway station. It's desolate outside, but I thought, you know, it's the virus. Nobody's out. I get to the subway station. There's like 10 cops outside of it. I'm like, Jesus, something must have been going on in the subway. I walk all the way down to Hollywood and Vine subway station. Same thing. I'm like, well, the subway's not working. I take out my phone. I'm trying to call an Uber. I'm like, fuck, there's no Ubers. Like my thing is just going like blink, 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 blink across. Like I've never seen it do that before. Wouldn't hail an Uber. And so I'm like, I guess I'm walking the four miles home and I walked all the way home. And then I found out when I got home that there was a fucking curfew. I'm like, oh Jesus, the they were all the way up in on Melrose at that point, and I hadn't realized it. I thought it was all going on downtown. Yeah, I mean, it was. Uh, I mean, around, like I live on you know Santa Monica Boulevard, basically, and there's not really a lot of stores to loot or you know do anything to. Uh, and the, the sheriff's department is literally. Yeah. You know, we can see it from the balcony. Uh, Melrose is the one that really got it bad. Yep. Uh, and some suns, I saw, well, when I was walking that night on Hollywood Boulevard, it was like they were preparing like for a hurricane. They were boarding up all the windows on stuff. You know, this is like 11 o'clock at night. I'm like, what are they doing? I'm like, oh yeah, the pro, they're worried about the the protests uh, and the riots and stuff. I live in East Hollywood, so I can hear downtown. It's like right. a war zone downtown. And then like WeHo is like a war zone. So I'm like surrounded by yeah. war sounds, basically a choppers, explosions, I mean, sirens. It's, uh, I mean, I think we're through the worst of it. But, yeah, I uh, hope so. I mean, you know, who knows? I mean, like, like you said, uh, one bad decision in this trial and, uh, you know, who knows? Cause I was around for the 92 riots here and it was a very similar vibe and, yeah, I don't. I I obviously wasn't here then, and I I don't think you were born. I was born in '86. I remember them on TV, watching them on television. My mom, when I moved here, brought them up to me every day. Like it's gonna be like that. And she's been freaking out about this, but uh, there's fucking protests in every city right now. It's more than the LA riots. It's every fucking where. You yeah, know? I mean that was the. I don't want to say the good thing, but yeah, I think that the, the, the also contributes to the fact forty million people aren't working. So it's like. What else yeah. are people going to do? But the weird thing is the stock market this week, I think this is the best week it's ever had. That's crazy. Like today it was up, uh, let me see, I think it was up 1,000 points, which... Uh, I don't really know how that shit works, so I, I have no insight as to why that would be the case. But Well, I thought this week this market's going to do... Yeah, it was up 829 points today. Jesus. Uh, well, I think that has to do, and I could be wrong. Reopening uh, and such? We, it's somewhat, like, you know, we... Uh, I went out with Chandler to a restaurant that's been closed for like th three, th I guess three months now, and uh, you could tell the employees are happy, like, uh, and there weren't that many people there, but, and then course the protest came which was actually kind of cool to be in the middle of because it's very peaceful yeah it's a little scary because literally out of the blue hundreds of people were outside this restaurant uh it was just like an overwhelming energy of just, yeah and and it was very peaceful though and they moved on there was no it, it didn't feel tense at all not really. I mean, uh, I think there was a few people because uh, Santa Monica Boulevard uh, going east, you know, there were cars going east. And then all of a sudden uh, there were cars on the wrong side of the road going west. And, and mm. I wouldn't say there were some tempers flaring, but, uh, you know, uh, I think the once the people who were in the right of way realized, uh, yeah, we'll just wait. That when Kobe died, I went to not his funeral, whatever, down at the Staples Center, like the day, you right. know, I had just I had just landed at LA, LAX and looked at my phone and it was like Kobe. It was like rumors or whatever, you know. And so then you find out he died. I just went to I'm like, I'm going to go to the Staples Center and just see what's going on down there. I saw some people were gathering and it was so many people that it, it's even though it was like obviously peaceful because everyone was like mourning Kobe. I still felt this twinge of like. What if someone just pulled out a fucking gun and was like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I mean, it's it still feel that. And like, I don't, that's why I don't do really well in like immersed in crowds like that. You know what I'm saying? Well, that was so, uh, 
you know, I mean, it would have been bad if it was just Kobe, but like with the kids also. Of course, yeah, yeah. No, it was a really sad moment, and it was it was powerful going down to the Staples Center and and feeling. It was like really the first time I felt like a part of Los Angeles. To be right. honest, as, as morbid as that sounds. No, but, I mean it, it's like he's. I mean, I was trying to think the other day who, who's really more famous than Kobe, and it, yeah. I guess you could say Jordan and and maybe LeBron. Yeah, like Shaq, uh, maybe I guess. Yeah, I, don't sure. know. I mean, he's he's probably he's a top 10 celebrity uh, actors included of, yeah of being a, a world he's the laker of a generation i mean yeah. He's, yeah um you know i just think people were so blown away by oh it was intense you know it was uh, so sad now as a comic what have you been doing the last three months in <sighs> quarantine like how i have, have you been, been well, I've, I'm lucky that we still podcast, so we have that. But I've been doing uh, streaming on Twitch. I stream like Madden and MLB The Show. And it's helping me pay the bills, pay make up for the fucking... I lost so many gigs. Like This was like the first year I was like headlining on the road, finally, like we, whole weekends instead of one-nighters and shit. And all of it was gone, and I was so bummed out. And I just like... It, the first few weeks, I was a mess. I was so depressed. And then I started doing, I'm like, well, I'm playing 10 hours of video games anyway, so I might as well like do it in front of people and see if they pay me money for it. And it's going well. So uh, I'm going to keep it going beyond quarantine as another, you know, but how do you piece think, of content. Like, I'm fascinated by. I'm I, honestly like, I'm lucky that I work with people that understand that world. Basically, I just turned on my PlayStation. They were like, let me set up your thing. And then people started watching and. You know, they subscribe to you and they donate and they send little like when they cheer, or when they do little bits. So like everything's a little bit of money. Plus you get ad revenue. So it all adds up to like a monthly amount. And if you get enough of it, you know, if you if you can stay consistent and like get enough people to keep coming back like it's a TV show or a podcast or whatever, then, you know, you can keep keep it riding. Like. I, this is gonna sound like I'm making fun of the problem. No, that's okay. I'm really. Uh, I was. I'm a boomer about it myself, to be honest. Because I know my one friend. Uh, now she's a hot chick, so right. She, she gets a little bit of leeway, I, I guess. Uh, like she makes really good money doing it. Like what? I'm not asking what you make, but like what? what like what's an amount of like that you could make? Like with a mid range following, like a couple grand. I, I'd say I have a mid range following right now and I just pay my rent. Right. And it's just that. So yeah, a couple grand, you know, here, and there. And, um, I, you know, some, the way that it's been explained to me is like, obviously there's people with monumental followings that make like millions of dollars. Like how does that have like podcast, famous podcasters? No, they're, they're they're It'd be like, you know, Rogan's a, f famous podcaster that makes a bazillion dollars they have their own versions of that like gamers they're like a joe rogan of the twitch world right like this guy ninja is that i guess and i don't know what he plays i don't really know much about him but i know that like this guy people watch him and they watch him to watch him be good at the game like they watch him to watch someone play the game at an elite level to the point where now that guy can go to theaters and sell tickets and people watch him live play fucking video games whereas my approach to it was like it's more like a live stream like a podcast where i happen to be playing video games you know what i mean yeah. i'm not fucking good at it i suck at it sometimes they like that the most but you know i treat it more like a podcast where it's like interactive because there's people in the chat you can talk to so it's more like a live like a periscope stream or something right. than it is me playing video games and just staring at the game and people watching me do that now, when do you think you're going to, uh, of course, it's uh, no one really knows anything when clubs are going to start to open again. Uh, like I'm supposed to. All play. my dates got shuffled to the fall, but I oh, okay. did. I got like, so I need two more to get rescheduled and I'm hoping they're earlier, but they're probably not going to be. But September's my first club weekends in Sacramento and um, the first weekend of September. But I did recently. Get and I don't know what day it's going to happen, but I got offered a one nighter in San Diego at the American Comedy Company. Oh yeah, yeah. And so I don't know what day that's going to happen, but it's going to be in the month of June. So either that's going to be my first set, or I also I'm going to go visit a friend in Boise, and I found a bar show there, 
And I figured that would be a good way to get the rust off, you know, like right. just go do some stupid bar show in Boise and like fuck around. I get to get to do 25. It'll be a good way to like just get back on stage and see how far off I am, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I'm supposed to do Edmonton in July and like I haven't been up in three months. Like, I've yeah, you got to go do a set in like a real set at a club then that's got to be tough. Like, like, are you doing an hour? Yeah, I mean, oh I've my got God. it. But no, of I, course, yeah, you've done hours before, but I'm saying, like, but I'm gonna be rusty. as your first set. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, that, that's what I was trying to avoid at all costs. Was I didn't want my first set to just be an hour because I mean, I know like uh, like Ari Manis uh, and a couple other comedy store comics are doing something tonight at American Comedy Company in San Diego. And- I think that's yeah, that was the pitch that they told me. They're like Ari's coming. They they've got this like one nighter thing going on where you do like. 20 30 minutes yeah it's pretty it's a pretty uh, good idea yeah they were like the first club to ever headline me so oh that's cool I'm very loyal to them. i've actually never even been to san diego so oh it's like it's a com it's there's so club. many clubs there right? yeah i mean there's madhouse there's uh la jolla Comedy palace mm-hmm. uh and la jolla is off you know, it's a little further away the, yeah. i don't want to say wider part but the more uh, well-to-do part right 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 uh, so uh, you know i think they like a certain style of comedy there like uh-huh. i think the other ones that are in downtown san diego you can be a little more wacky or so you mentioned randy orton earlier by the way his little brother does comedy oh but he lives he, he's like a local st louis comic right so if you ever do the helium in st louis sometimes he'll like mc oh, and then randy orton's like in the crowd i would geek out yeah that it was it happened to me one time it was pretty fucking wild I would, I would pitch in my storyline. I I stayed in. I I never even said hi, but I was like, God, I want to fucking. I hope you laughed. You know. Oh, I know. That's the worst thing. It's like at Ralphie Mays Memorial. X Pac was in the front row. Oh wow! Because uh, I guess him and Ralphie were friends, and uh, I had to go on last, and the crowd was pretty tired. It wasn't a comedy show, but sure. I, and so I just uh, I did this. You know, me and Ralphie bonded over Gary Hart, who was like this. Uh, wrestling manager like a jim Cornette type yeah yeah uh he was really funny this bald white guy with a fu man chew and they spoke kind of spoke in jive like, mm-hmm. and uh i said I just did a gary hart impression i was like god i hope x-pac thinks this is funny and i guess gary hart had managed x-pac in some weird promotion so uh yeah i hate it when people i admire are in the crowd yeah me too i had a, a show one time um jimmy hart mouth of the south oh, absolutely. he came to do like a rock club and i don't know what he was doing comedy or spoken word i don't even fucking remember but they were like do you want to open for him and i'm like okay so this is like a rock club people are kind of moseying about it. it's like almost like one of those conventions because they got other shit going on there's children i didn't know there were going to be fucking children there and so I see the children running around. I'm like, well, that eliminates about 80% of what I'm, what I usually talk about. So I'm trying to do like crowd work and like a wrestler shit. But when they introduce me, it's not Jimmy Hart, obviously, and it's a wrestling crowd. They boo the fuck out of me, like boo me so hard, like right out of the gate. Why? That's how I start. Just because I wasn't Jimmy Hart coming oh, in. Oh, right, right. So I do my like, I'm only doing 10 minutes. I like played into the boos, you know. And then when I walked off, the best thing any wrestler person has ever said to me was Jimmy Hart goes, you got that heel pop, baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was like the funniest shit I ever, I was like, oh, that's so cool. Because he heard me get booed. He's like, oh yeah, you got the heel pop, baby. Uh, he's great. <laughs> and still kind of looks the same. Like, yeah. You know, we talk about Flair, maybe not aging that well and staying, but like Jimmy Hart basically looks the same. He does. He's fucking, and he's the nicest guy. He was so nice. He's like, anytime you're in Tampa, come look me up. I'm like, all right. Uh, So that's nice to see at least one person from the world of pro wrestling. Not, uh, You know know who also is super cool that I met a bunch of times and I interviewed him and stuff for the radio was Mean Gene. He used to like come on my radio show like every couple of years, you know, but he'd always act like he remembered you. You know, I never thought he'd remember me, but he would always treat you as if he'd remember you. You know, that's great. Yeah, he was always so charming. He was like the best. I mean, I was like, I always want to have a drink with Mean Gene. You know what I mean? Like at the end of a night, drink martinis or something. I always thought that would be like a fantasy of mine. Well, it just sucks that he's gone. Yeah, it yeah. blows, dude. It's he, that was a big one for me that I 
that yeah. sucked. But he lived a long life, you know. He was, was it wasn't sad. like he was sick or any or like it wasn't like he died tragically or anything like that, you know. I mean, I'll be fucking devastated when Kamala dies. Like, I'll cry. I'll cry when Ric Flair dies for sure. I, I almost did, will, yeah. Like, uh, staying. I'll cry. I mean, he's he's not that old, but right. Because uh, you get attached. They're like superheroes, of course. You know, and like Flair, every even if you're just a wrestling fan on the outskirts, like it's Ric Flair. Oh yeah, you, I mean, athletes adore him, even though they don't like. Maybe they didn't even watch it. They just watch his, like, promos. They yeah. just like his swag, you know? I mean, Scott Hall, I'll be sad, you know. I will, which almost happened. I mean, shit. Yeah, I mean, thank you to DDP Yoga. Yeah, right? That uh, shit, that match on YouTube or whatever is so painful to fucking watch. Which one? That indie one where he was, like, all pilled out. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a few of those. Uh, yeah. I think the one was, like, the last straw. That they put it in, his do- in that documentary, right? Uh, well, there was that one, and then there was one where he came to, I think, ECW, but it wasn't like uh, in the in their usual ballroom. I right. think in Philly, it was like a, in a high school, and you know, it's like the backstage, just like bed sheets, like it wasn't yeah. even like a it was it was like a fire a VFW post. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. really was. I don't. I, I, it might not. It might have been a VFW. Yeah, and uh, you know, he's walking out. You can tell he's pretty fucked up on whatever. I was like, oh man, yeah. So uh, I mean, Didi and Jake the Snake is same thing. Uh, he had a couple of those rough matches too, where you're like, Jesus. Yeah, well, he did. You know that, those uh, indies. The documentary Beyond the Mat. Yeah. Which was uh, a fantastic documentary. There's yeah, my mean, favorite line from that is Jake the Snake talking about like, and saying it in a way that it's like, like almost like he's been through a tragedy. He's like, you know. Uh, when you make love to five women at once, it makes it real hard to go home and make love to your wife. <laughs> I was like, that quote just like fucking always stuck out to me. Yeah, I mean, uh, he said it in such a sad way. It I was know, like, he just all fucking, you know, it was a, like a documentary style. So I think that you know the cameras they used weren't necessarily like the the highest quality. Oh, so. sure, no, it was old too. I mean, they were using. Like, footage from back in the day i mean he was following them around forever uh, barry i want to see the guy's name i forget the guy's name but uh he actually conned to get into vince mcmahon's office yeah and like so i i think he probably bullshitted the ww and said oh it's gonna be a great documentary we're gonna really portray you guys well and you know it was pretty uh you had the puke incident in there the guy yeah. withdraws you had mankind uh I mean that that documentary is amazing. Yeah, and you got had to, his kids had to watch him do that I quit match and they're crying and shit. How hot did that chick grow up to be though, Noel? Holy yeah, hell. I mean, uh, god damn. Uh, well, the wife's <laughs> pretty hot. Like. She is, but it's still wild that Noel Foley is a product of Mick Foley's yeah. jer- jizz, you know. Missing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he yeah. looks like a fucking crazy person and he's got this smoke show daughter yeah i mean i'm 51 and i'm sore from playing recreational hockey right imagine that guy can't imagine he's got to be about the same age maybe maybe older than me but 30 years of what he's done i i don't know how he walks have you i have not watched him do his set he does comedy now. I know it's a lot of storytelling and stuff. And I'm not saying I would. I I like that wrestlers do that. I think that they, they have a lot of stories to tell, and that could be funny. They can get laughs, whatever you know. So I don't mind that they do it. I just haven't seen it, so I wasn't sure if he was still doing it or if it was like going successful. Uh, I know I opened up for uh, Jake the Snake. At uh, I'm not bragging at the dojo. Yeah, no, I at, I saw that. I actually opened for Jake the Snake at a comic book store back in Buffalo once. He, I, I mean, what did you think? I love. Oh, him. he's his stories are incredible. I mean, he could. I mean, whether they're sad or whether they're funny, his stories are captivating. I it was amazing. It was weird to have a. I felt a comic open for him, to be quite honest with you. But you do need something to start it, I suppose. But. He is amazing. I could listen to that guy fucking talk forever. Yeah, he's the, by far and away the best storyteller. Like, yeah, even if you don't like wrestling, uh, you know, it, he's it's. Not, I don't know if it's because he's a pretty big guy still, and he does. He just has that it factor. He's like know. articulate, yeah, and, so, and like subtle, and 
there's a lot going on there and it's fucking amazing to listen to. I wish more of those guys would go do stuff like that. I wish the ones that were like, I don't think everyone's like him or uh, Mick Foley, like, uh, like Flair would probably be amazing, but I guess he'd gas out pretty soon. Well, Flair used to have a podcast and I think what happened was he was getting a little too drunk doing it and he would spill some secrets that maybe he wasn't supposed to spill. And then he would also, um, you know, just ramble to the point where he would forget what he was talking about. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, they were basically got it became untenable to do that podcast still with Ric Flair because something was going off the rails there. He would lose his train of thought. He, interviews, he would start like just rambling. Well, that's why they brought me in for Piper's podcast. Just like, I mean, I love Roddy, so well, it helps keep him on track. You know, well, he would be like starting a story on say Sting, and it's a great story. He, you know, he's oh yeah, I wrestled him with Abdullah the Butcher when they were the Blade Runners, him and Warrior, and he's like, oh wow, I didn't know. And we were wrestling in Maryland, and he, his memory was pretty good. And then he just all of a sudden switched topics and be talking about the Von Erics, who that had nothing to do with the you know the Sting story. And yeah, Carries were in the hotel and he took his foot off, and I was like, wait, what? Yeah, what, yeah. What, where, what is that? Where's the A to B here? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think a few of those guys definitely need a partner or sidekick. Or- yeah, not everyone's a broadcaster or whatever. So, like, they need um they need some direction, just a person to guide them or whatever. And then, and they had they had that with Flair with that Conrad Thompson fellow who does he's all that. He's pretty the, good. He's a good, uh, yeah, he's created an empire, you know. Do you like that Pritchard uh, podcast? I haven't listened to it in forever, but. The only thing I don't like about Pritchard is, uh, like when he talks bad about the wrestlers, like he really didn't like the warrior and right. I mean, warriors, my guy. So I'm a little biased, but, uh, you know, it just seems like he's sometimes going, well, everyone's a dick, but me. Right. Right. And I, so, uh, I kind of stopped listening once he went back to the WWE because I thought like, well, he won't shit on stuff now. Yeah. You know I mean? no, I like, it seems like he'll be biased now. Yeah. I mean, I don't necessarily want them to like, shit or talk shit if that's not no 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 yeah i just want it to be genuine and not like yeah. the company line i suppose you know like if something's going because he used to tell great vince stories you know and it's like does that stop now that you work for the company you know right it's like i'm a big jim norton guy like he's awesome uh but he does the podcast with matt sarah for the ufc basically I yeah forget what it's called but it's like well you're not going to really go all in on some of the things the ufc does wrong Right, Uh, because it's provided, it's it's hosted by the, yeah, it's exactly, it's like any sports team that has their radio show, you know what I mean? It's like the same thing, it's it's basically propaganda for the, (laughs) for the entity, you know? Which is what I love uh, about, like, the LA Kings, their older broadcasters, retired Bob Miller, and the Sabres, uh, the great, he's really why I got direct TV, so I can listen to Sabre games. The great Rick Jenneret. You can get, Rick, uh, you can get Sabres games on yeah, here because home, MS, MSG dude is such a pain in the ass. I mean, now I've figured out I, I have the NHL package thingy, right. but to get MSG even in Buffalo is a fucking pain in the ass. It's such a dumb network to put it on. It used to be on Empire Sports Network, which was the best, and then they switched it to MSG, which is all New York teams. They thought we could just get lumped in with them. So, like, when a Sabres game isn't on, you got all this Rangers shit all day long. Right. And it's all this Islanders programming, Rangers, or no, not Islanders, but Rangers programming. And um, it was just annoying. And it was like, I love Rick Jenneret, and um, I get goosebumps when I hear, like, I have the CD of, like, his Mayday. greatest calls. Mayday. <laughs> Uh, fucking Jimmy Hoffa, the, the fucking fights. When yeah. The fight when a good fight breaks out, it's uh, like the brawls back in the late '90s against the Flyers in the playoffs was always electric. That was like my heyday of. I would watch every fucking game. I'd sit in the same spot on the floor and watch every fucking game. Like the '97 to '99 seasons, they really fucking broke my heart when they lost to Dallas Stars. But it was. They, well, you know, that's a tough one because I mean, it technically, yeah, I mean, I think it's a good goal, but under the rules at that time, it right. wasn't right. Yeah, but you know. it was like double overtime. I had fallen asleep and I woke up and the whole living room was dark and I didn't know what happened. And I went into my dad's room and I go, What happened? And he goes, They lost. And I just cried like right on the spot. 
and it was broke me. I mean, it was just like Brett Hulse. I mean, it, it, like technically it shouldn't have counted, but in today's game, it's a goal. But like, so I always felt bad for the Sabres. Yeah. Uh, Dominic Hasek was my favorite oh, player amazing. ever. It was, I just, I don't think I'll ever watch a player like that again every day. You know what I mean? He's ahead like, of his time. I mean, nowadays it seems like almost every goalie plays like him or at least tries to, yeah. you know, with the acrobatic style, uh, you know, uh, but he was like a. It was like, it was everything. It was like his pads, his helmet. It was fucking. Like, basically, have his back to the shooter, sprawled, and like would just throw his arm in the air and, and save it with like the back. Yeah, of he'd his like glove. do a spin move and like backhand it. He'd use his like uh, blocker to like catch it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he'd drop his stick somehow and like. He was innovative. Like, he was. He would. I remember my favorite thing he used to do when he'd clear the puck and his. I remember. John Muckler, like early on when Hashik first got to the team, he used to like leave the crease, right? Like he right. used to come out and challenge people. And I remember he came out to the fucking blue line. And I remember just like, I was at it this game. And I remember John Muckler's face, like going like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? Like yelling at him. He comes all the way out to the blue line to like take a guy out. And uh, his other thing that he did though, is he put the, he'd catch the puck in his glove and then he'd throw it up in the air and then just hit it like a bat hit with his stick. That's how he'd clear the puck, like, out of the air. He'd hit the puck out of the air with his fucking, the broad part of his stick. Oh, he was, like, uh, so fun to watch. And, like, you know, I was a big, uh, like, the Sabres always had tough teams. Uh, you know, like, Larry Playfair and, that, like, that's oh, way, sure. way before. The Broad time. Street Bullies uh, uh, well, you that had they fought against. Team. Yeah, uh, if you were the Sabers, because you knew at some point you you were going to play, play the Flyers. Philly. Yeah, you know the Rangers had tough teams, Islanders, uh, but uh, Rob. I mean, of course, Rob Ray was very tough. Yeah, the nineties we had Rob Ray. Or we Donnelly. had uh, yeah. Um, who else was up? Well, Barnaby. Barnaby, uh, he was like a real pest. That guy. I mean, he's still a menace. He's like yeah. a pest in real life. We just got to learn how to channel that energy. The, yeah, the, <laughs> the boogeyman, Bob Bugner. Bob Bugner, yeah. Uh, I mean, they always had, uh, and you know, uh, who was, uh, Andrew Peters, Andrew was, Peters. Yeah. He's still a Buffalo. He, he, Me and him had a, a thing actually like a bad thing. Oh, what happened? Uh, so he does, I used to do radio. He used to do radio. And, uh, I remember he got like his radio gig. He was like, he was working. I don't know if he was working at a bar, but I would always see him at this bar. And I, it seemed like he was like bar backing. You oh, know, this is like after his this career. This is after his career. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, is, is Andrew Peters like fucking bar backing at huh. Coles right now? This is weird. And uh, I went on the radio. I kind of like made a joke about it or something. I was like, Andrew Peters is a bar back at Coles or something. And uh, I was like making fun of him. And then he started doing radio also. And he started like taking jabs on the air at me. And so we went back and forth a little bit. And then um, we both judged a comedy contest at Helium together. And we like didn't really talk and we just kind of like but sat there. he knew there. who you were. Yeah. And then I knew who he was, obviously. And then like later on, like a year later after that, we saw each other at that thing. He goes, this guy, he like started tweeting all this shit about me. He's like, this guy's mad because I eliminated him from a comedy contest and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, I was judging it with you. I wasn't fucking in the comedy contest. So we just kept going back and forth for whatever reason. We just never. And then like he gets really, he he would get really aggressive on Twitter to the point where he does that thing where he like, I'll beat you up kind of shit. I'm like, of course you're going to beat me up, dude. I'm fucking five, five and a dork. You know what I mean? Like and he's a big dude. Yeah. He's huge. He's a fucking fighter. I mean, he's an enforcer. So of course you're going to beat me up. It's like good. Like, you know, what do you want me to say to that dude? So we always had like this, uh, funny little feud going on through the radio, but, uh, you know, he, you know, the, there was, um, who else was a fucking dope fighter back in like, I mean, there were so many. They always had. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the saber. Well, they had Ed Hospadar for a little bit, but he was in toward the end. Um, Andy Sutton was a pretty tough, dude. Yeah. Uh, Fucking. Um, well, Coletta wasn't. Coletta was it? Coletta wasn't a fighter per se, but he made that happen. Yeah. I love Ho hometown uh, boy, by the way, like from Buffalo. Oh, uh, that, well, you know, I always thought the saber should trade for Dustin Brown from the Kings. Oh, I would he's love from, that. I think Ithaca. Yeah. Uh but and I think at one point it almost happened. There's uh, been a few um 
that have come through but didn't stick that were from, there was one that there's a professional player that went to my high school uh bailey what's his first name josh maybe josh bailey but uh he's young, way younger than, i didn't go to high school with him he's way younger than me i want to say dan but i don't know if that's true but i'm pretty sure it's josh bailey, okay but i could be wrong he's I mean, he's a uh african-american gentleman oh, okay then it's not josh bailey okay yeah so i don't know but um you sure it's bailey I want to say it is, but I could again. I could be wrong. I might be an idiot. They've had some black player, uh, Mike Greer. Yep, Mike Greer was f- on the Sabers. Yep, he's a pretty good player. We had a we had a like three at one time at one point, which I thought was remarkable. Yeah. We had Greer, we had uh, Jean Luc Grand Pierre, tough dude, and uh, we had uh, a guy Roman Ender. Yeah, that was I. Fo- he follows me on Twitter, <laughs> and we still like tweet each other just because I was like I started following like hockey players that were like kind of fringe ones from when I was right. loving the team to see if they follow me back or whatever. Well, he's from Kenya. Yeah. It's, it's like, crazy. How the fuck did he get into hockey? Yeah. He will. Someone they moved, moved him to Canada eventually. Uh, he was a tough dude. Yeah. Uh, but that was like, uh, I think my favorite Sabres brawl is when, uh, was it Chris Neal from Ottawa? Oh, the Drury. Yeah. He, he bull rushed Drury and then the fucking... Bench clearing man. brawl, and then you have like Lindy Ruff and uh, Murray going at it between the glass. And I just, this is why I want to upgrade my podcast capabilities because I would love to play that uh, clip right now because it cause just so happened uh, that there was a whistle stop for whatever reason after that. And Lindy Ruff waited and he waited. And then the, I, I don't know why to this day. Ottawa to put out like Spezza. They put out their main line. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, oh my God. And then he just was like, fuck that. I put out all the goons. You see like Lindy Ruff, Pat Collette on the back. And then yep. uh, Peters comes out. And, and they Adam were like, Mayer, Adam Merritt. Uh, who played for the Kings a little bit. And he still lives in Buffalo. He married uh, a girl I used to work with. Oh, really? Yeah. They have two, I think they have player. twins. Yeah. He was, he was a cool guy. He's still, nice now career. he coaches, um, I think, for Canisius Hockey in, in Buffalo, and, one of the uh, schools. Uh, and uh, Peters basically got his ass kicked by Ray Emery, the goalie. Yeah, Ray Emery beat the shit out of Peters. Yeah. Rest in peace, uh, Ray Emery. Ray Emery, yeah. He was a Golden Glove boxer, though, Ray Yeah, Emery. it was funny. Well, like- Marty Biron tried to come out and fight him, too, which is so sad because poor Marty Biron's like the nicest guy. Yeah. He's just- like, a, like a, like hey, how you doing kind of guy, and he's trying to fight Ray, Ray Emery, and Ray Emery doesn't even want, he, he like knows. I'm, he's like, I'm going to destroy you, dude. So then Peters like kind of cut in. Yeah. And took over in that fight. My favorite one, though, were always the bench clearing brawls against Ottawa. And it was when, like, or excuse me, against Philadelphia in the late 90s, like 97, 98, when Garth Snow would always fight. Shields. We had Steve Shields. Yeah. And those guys would fucking throw haymakers. Because Hashik was in those early playoff years in the late 90s, Hashik was always hurt, always a groin thing or something. So Shields would play. And he would always fight Garth Snow every fucking time. That's probably my, outside of the Peters Emery fight, my favorite Generette call was, uh, when, who was it? It was Dan Cordick of Philly, not John, but Dan fighting Rob Ray. And Snow is kind of loitering in the yep. crease. And he, he did some to make, uh, Ray like loses balance a little bit, and then you just see Shields beeline. Just fucking scary. I loved Steve Shields. He was so fucking fun. And, and there was another guy that fought Garth Snow for us as a backup, uh, Trefiloff. Oh yeah, Andre, Andre Trefiloff. Yeah. Uh, and he, but he didn't fare as well. Shields, like you could tell, Shields like was into it. You know. Oh I mean? yeah, he. Uh, even I think Snow kept his mask on. Yeah, Shields was like, "Fuck that!" Shields just like started <laughs> throwing riots, and they're like, "Damn, that's good." Well, I, Brad May helped him out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When they started fighting, May kind of came in, and I don't know if he felt Shields was at a disadvantage, but he he kind of like put his just, elbow in him a little. Yeah, he, he just nudged Snow a little bit so he'd be off balance. Yeah, <laughs> and that's when Shields started with the riots and uh, that rivalry. Though at that time was fucking electric like it could have it could have gone that way i feel like every second like you could oh you're just you feel the tension every second and then it got that way to be with ottawa around the time you were talking with the drury uh briere years of the sabers where we were like still good but we'd ever the playoffs were that 2006 season was the one that like broke me as a fan to be quite honest yeah i mean that's 
I mean, the Sabers were always there. You know, they just yeah. That uh, and then two thousand after two thousand six, after we went to the Eastern Conference Finals against the Hurricanes and went to Game Seven, we would have definitely won that cup too if we would have beat them. And we lost. We had such we we're decimated by injuries. Then Hash, you know, then um, excuse me, then uh, Drury and Briere, they don't resign them. They I mean, let them it's both tough, go. Like you know, because hockey is. Um, you know, there's a salary cap, and, and oh, they they could have though. They just didn't do it. They didn't. It, yeah. it was a real, and it was like a blow to the city. And then, you know, we went to the playoffs in 2007, and that might be the last time we went to the playoffs. Well, now they're in it. Oh no, uh, are they? Because it's that we're 24 teams this year. We didn't even make that. Well, I'm the Kings are right there with them. Uh, I feel bad for Eichel because he's got dude. We're ball. I I get so sad. I mean, we're he's in his fifth year almost now. And he hasn't gone to the playoffs once, and we're wasting him. It's just a wit. It just bums me the fuck. And the team's not being run well. Like the same people that own the Bills own the Sabers, which is weird. Yeah, and the Bills are like flourishing, but the Sabers, who used to be fine, even with the old owners, were fine, are floundering. They're not even doing like fan appreciation type stuff. They're not doing. I mean, the game experience is lacking. It's it's just been like chopped together it's like almost there's no one at the helm and then of course you know as far as the hockey operations go it's brutal and they they won't get rid of the gm fucking jason bottle is the gm i mean i really think every team should could learn from how the kings won their two cups yeah three years because kings were bad for a while i mean a long time sure and then they drafted quick you got to start from the center out you need a great goalie a great defenseman and hopefully a, a great, to very good center. And that's what, you know, they drafted. We kind of did that backwards. Yeah, I mean, they got Quick, Dowdy, Brown, uh, Kopitar, and then, you know, you get the periphery players after that, like a sure. Brown. Sure, build them in. Uh, you know, that's what, you know, Sabres already had Eichel. So you, we had Eichel, then we got uh, another number one overall pick, Rasmus Dahlin. Yeah, I mean, uh, so you got the... Uh, yeah, we've got Two-thirds. all these. We've got all these picks. You know, we got Dylan Cousins coming up in the farm system. Um, there's all kinds of talent, but for whatever reason, and then they also the goalie situation is a nightmare. But I think that's really the missing link the missing and the thing. defense. I mean, we have Dalian, but the rest of the defense is garbage. Uh, I mean, I love uh, Ristolainen. Yeah, I love him too. He, he actually spoke out about how it's like he's sick of this shit, well, and, I, I, and I like that. Yeah, no, me too. I, be, I want them to say that. Even Eichel's kind of starting to be like. If he asked for a trade tomorrow, I would not hate him. I wouldn't. I would understand. You know. Well, I mean, they. You know, you take a team like say Arizona. You know, they've got the assets to. Uh, I don't know if he'd want to play in Arizona, but you know. Yeah. I, I don't know what. I think is. at this point he would want to play anywhere that might make the playoffs. You know, it's tough. It's like. Uh, you know, you look at the team. I mean, he's going to cost a boatload. I mean, yeah. uh, a team like the Kings probably has the – I don't think he's going to come to L.A., but, like, you know, they have a lot of – I think they have the number one ranked uh, farm system right now. So the Ontario got, Rain. Well, I mean, they were okay, but, uh, you know, they have uh, – I mean, they've had to rebuild. <laughs> if you follow the Kings. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. They've had a uh, – Last couple of years has been a little rough. Well, it's it's funny. It all started with Boynob hitting his wife, allegedly. <laughs> yeah. And uh, just they had to trade. There were so many moves they had to do because of that one. It, it was like dominoes. Yeah. They had to trade a number one pick, uh, I think, in the Sakara trade to, yeah. to get a defenseman. He ended up just playing 12 games. That was from us. us. <laughs> uh, he came yeah. from, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then... Uh, he was part of our dog shit. They traded a number one uh, in the trade to get Lucic. Uh, and, you know, because they were they were always trying to get Voinov's replacement. Right. And so they were bad for a long time. And eventually the window closes on those other guys, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, you know, you I, I, and for the Kings anyway, like, unfortunately, they, they had to overpay some guys for winning a couple cups, which I'm fine with. Yeah. You get two cups, like yeah. Once they, that happens, you're gonna have to pay them. And they probably would have gotten the middle cup if uh, I think Stoll and uh, I think Stoll and Boynton. Who got it hurt. between the 
in Chicago. The, Chicago, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm a King fan, so I'm a bit biased, but I know they they were just on a roll from yeah. 2012 to 2015. Uh, I think if Stoll and Voynov don't get hurt. Patrick uh, Kane's from Buffalo, from speaking to yeah, the, I mean, the Blackhawks. There's always rumors with him. Uh, it's more than rumors. He's, I mean, we'll say the rumor part, I will say allegedly, but... It's not alleged that he is a piece of shit. <laughs> like, but as I mean, a guy. you know, he's available, I think, for the first time. And, like, of course, it would have to be a gigantic haul coming back. But I don't know if the Sabres have the. I don't think we have the. Maybe we do have the cap room. That would be a real coup to get him to come over. But, um. I mean, you might have to try to go Eichel for Kane. But, yeah, yeah. But then that's like. That would be silly. It doesn't really do much. Yeah. Just, he, I mean, I remember that kid used to like, you'd see him in a bar, he'll just spit on the fucking ground. He doesn't fuck, you know what I mean? Like, he's are we like, talking oh, about Patrick Kane or Evander Kane? Patrick Kane. Okay. Because Evander Kane's another wild one. Evander player. Kane played in Buffalo. There were some dicey situations there, but he was found uh, innocent. And um, he was then sent to San Jose where he's thri- he thrives. Oh, I love him. Yeah. He's a great player. I mean, I was sad to see him. I really was excited to have him on the team. But Patrick Kane, he grew up in Buffalo. He's like from there, and uh, he's had some real dicey situations. It's, he's cleaned up his act. I'm sure he's matured. You know, he was just a fucking kid, you know, back then. But you know, you'd see him at a bar or something. He's acting like an asshole or whatever. And then there's the alleged story of him and his friends beating up a cab driver so they don't have to pay the fare. And see, I thought that was Patrick Kane. Yeah, that's Patrick. Kane. Oh, but okay, I'm getting Evander. Get no, Evander's not from Buffalo. They're both fuck ups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Evander Kane had some issues with women. So did Patrick. Uh, who hasn't? Yeah. Well, in this case, some real allegations came on Patrick Kane. Like the DA was involved. It was wild. I oh, remember yeah. being but, on the radio during that time. Well, I mean, with athletes, though, you know, it, it's so weird. Like those he said, she said things. Yeah. It's like. Uh, it's funny because Buffalo is such a small town. Yeah. That once you found once people found out who the woman was, everyone was like, "Oh, I know her. Yeah, I, I think Pat's fine." <laughs> but then, you know, once it's out there, like yeah. you're fucked, whether it's true or not. Of so course. I, I mean, I used well, to, Stink was on him for a while. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and he was probably innocent in that particular case, but like I remember, he got booed every ra- arena he'd go to. Well, I'm sure MSG fans were pretty brutal for him. Yeah. Hey, you fucking. Oh my god! Yeah, they would say all kinds of wild shit to him. But Evander Kane, I just don't think he enjoyed his time in Buffalo. And why would he have? I mean, we were horrible while he was there. He was like the only guy playing well, you know. But like San Jose, now you know the interesting thing is that I think they're going to start to lose. Yeah, they've got some bad, bad. Well, they're old as fuck. They got Carlson. They got Burns. Yeah, uh, they got mad old people. Is Joe Thornton still playing there? I mean, I don't know. I don't think he'll be coming back. Uh, but, like, the, you know, if everyone's healthy, they have a great team. But, like, Kane makes a lot, I think, seven plus. Who'd they just lose? Like, one of their core guys. Pavelski. Uh, went Pavelski, to yes, yeah. Uh, but that hurt. But, you know, I don't think they could have resigned him. Right. Uh, so uh, it'll be interesting to see. Because I look at San Jose as city-wise kind of being like Buffalo. Like, it, it's a little smaller. Than, right. So I, now will will Pat or uh, Evander Kane act out in San Jose? I feel like it's well. I mean, compared to Buffalo, San Jose is fucking Disney World. I think, but uh, you know what I mean. It's still California. You're you're X miles from LA. You're X miles from Sa- more. I guess more San Francisco, right? Like right. you're closer to there. But I mean, it's definitely there's beaches. You know what I mean. You're not in like nine feet of snow the whole season, and you know stuck going to you know same bars over and over they i mean all the sabers would go to like these this, the bars right outside the arena it would be wild you'd see them out there and then when i started becoming like the same age as them i started to dislike him like Derek roy and i had a thing too for a little while because i would make fun of him on the radio because basically it's over girls like you just like you'd be out with your a girl and then like Derek roy steals your girl so i'd be like this guy fucking sucks i hate him <laughs> i would just go on the radio and trash my used to do bits and uh, Nate Kirby was another one that. Um, oh yeah, little guy. I did a, a Nate Kirby helmet cam like sketch reoccurring thing, and it became like kind of a hit. And basically, the it was just like me talking like a child, but I was Nate Kirby because he's like five, you know, he's the same right. height as me. And that was like, you know, it was just a silly bit. And uh, a guy I work with rode in an elevator with him at this convention thing or whatever, 
And he goes, hey, did you ever hear of uh, Nate Kirby helmet cam? And he goes, oh, I've heard about it. <laughs> he wasn't, like, thrilled about it, but right. I still, like, revere him. I thought, I, thought, I thought I was honoring him, and he still plays. He plays for fucking Columbus still. I can't believe it. He got sent down to the Lake Erie Monsters or Cleveland Monsters now or whatever they're called, Lake Monsters or whatever, and uh, made his way back up to the fucking pros again. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, now it's a good time for guys like Gerby who are a little smaller. You know, I don't know if he would have survived in those, you know, 90s wars with Ottawa. Right. No, I have no idea. Yeah. My God, in the 80s, like. uh, Although he's trying, he's out there trying to fight Chara and shit. (laughs) You know what I mean? I was watching a fight of him yesterday. Uh, I do the elliptical and I just put on hockey fights just to make the time go by. And he fought some guy, uh, some guy in Boston. It wasn't Chara, but it was a big right. Dude. It was such a big dude, uh, and he held his own. Like, yeah, he, you know, he got him. And he did like an MMA, like double leg on the guy. To, he lifted him up, and and it was against the the board. So the guy kind of lost his balance, and then once that happened, Gerby like got in some shots. That was the thing about him. He he would he just kind of came out of nowhere, and everyone wrote him off because he's like this little guy. And he would just make plays and just play like gutsy. And it was like so fun because he was so tiny. You know what I mean? You're like, oh, he's just weaving in and out of people and shit. This is nuts. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, he, definitely a... He, if like Mar- if McSorley and that were still playing, he'd get decked and shit yeah, all the time. I mean, but small. I mean, but, you know, Theo Fleury thrived. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it can happen. But, you know, now it's you look at smaller players who are getting drafted. Like last year, Montreal drafted... Uh, Cole Caulfield, who's uh, can't be any more than 5'6", 150. Yeah, he's tiny. Uh, but he's an amazing goal scorer. And, like, you know, 10 years ago, I, I don't – Cole Caulfield would have been lucky if he went in the sixth round. Yeah, right. Uh, so. Well, yeah, the game's changing. Yeah, it's game's changing. I mean, I, I mean, I miss the uh, the fights. Uh, that uh, documentary, The Last Enforcer, is yeah. – was or so Ice amazing. Guardians. Yeah, Ice Guardians. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no. I, mean, there, I think there is one called The Last. Oh, okay. Uh, the one I just, I remember the one guy, like, they just, you know, they show him and he's like, would you go back and do it again? And he's like, with a little more fire. I forget yeah. who even said it, but it was like, that one had Ty Domi in it and had a. I think it was the actor Jay Baruchel. I might be. Yes, he was in it. Yeah. Last name. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I do miss the. Uh, that like you know rob ray fighting oh whenever we play the leafs and which is a lot Domi. you always knew rob ray and ty dome were gonna go at it rob ray's gonna fucking jersey's gonna come off he would like leave it all loose and shit so he'd be ready to go uh, but i uh because the the games now especially in the regular season it's like you're watching a glorified scrimmage yeah they're uh, some well it depends what team you're watching obviously i mean I, as as a sabers fan you get disheartened by it because you're right. It's like, how about how about some fire in the play here? You yeah, know what I mean? I mean like, Jesus, like not, coming out like slow and shit. I don't know. It's fucking real, I don't know. brutal. I mean, there's got to like, but I do love the playoffs. Like, there, there's got to be a way, and I know it's not sustainable in an 80 game season to to have every game have the playoff energy. But yeah. you got to find some way to. And I'm not saying that fighting be more prevalent so it's probably not these guys are so big they're gonna actually hurt people right uh, the rivalries aren't yeah. the same as they were they're not as heated i feel like it's like they realigned all the divisions so much that the old rivalries don't carry over anymore like i still fucking hate the leafs and every sabers fan does i still fucking hate ottawa i hate philly more than all of them right but we're not we're not in the same division as philly anymore you know what i mean we're like they're still in the same conference, but we're not in the same division as them. So we don't see them as often. And Boston, I guess I still don't like, but I never really gave a shit about Boston. I actually, Cam Neely is like my favorite hockey player aside from Hashik. So I always kind of like was a little bit of a traitor as a kid when the Bruins came to town. My cousin used to work security at the odd. And when the Bruins came, she let me like stand in the tunnel when they like leave, you know, to go out on the bus. It was a little more easy to do back in these old ass stadiums. And I had all the starting lineups for basically the entire first line of the Bruins. I had Ray Bork, Adam Oates and Cam Neely starting lineups, but I wanted to get Ally Afraidy and Brian Smolinski's autographs too. Everyone gave me an autograph. 
And then Adam Oates came up and I was like, can I have your autograph? And he was like, nope. And he just walked right the fuck by me. Yeah, it was crazy. He wouldn't sign it. And then Cam Neely, who was my favorite, came up and signed my thing. And he was like, don't worry about Adam. And he like just signed my thing or whatever. And then like took a picture with me. And it was, it was so funny just to hear him say that though. Like as a little kid, you know, No, beat it kid. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Uh, Well, Josh Potter, I could talk hockey. Yeah. I'm sorry if I, Board everyone out there with the hockey talk, but I enjoy talking to you about it. I don't care. I don't, <laughs> good, good. It's my podcast. That's true. Yeah, it's our podcast. Hell yeah. You know, and I realized not a lot a, of people out here watch hockey. I mean, it's like uh, you know, there's just so much to do out here that you have to win the cup to even get the slightest uh, interest going about the Kings. And well, can I tell you before you wrap up? This is please, please. I. I uh, I love, I've actually been able to fall in love with hockey again living out here because the games are at fucking four o'clock. So I can still go do stand up after. There was a time when I started doing stand up where I started to hate hockey because they were like, the Sabres were good when I started and no one was coming to shows. If the Sabres were on TV, you might as well cancel the fucking show. It's over. But then right. they started sucking. So people stopped giving a fuck and they'd come to shows more. But. Now I can go to I can watch a hockey game and then I can go, still go out to the club afterwards. You know, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. That is, you get to see all the East Coast games out here at a decent time. Yeah. And, uh, so uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens when uh, I think they start. Uh, yeah, what's when does that begin? I think Monday is Phase Two, which is teams can train in their facilities uh, and do organized drills. So basically, a, a, a somewhat of the start of a training camp, and then Phase Three is the full training camp. And then uh, phase four, I believe, is at some point in July, they do the buy-in round, which is the eight teams who can compete uh, for the spot. Right. And it's fair because, and you know, this yeah. is such a uh, once-in-a-lifetime thing, what we're going through right. uh, with the coronavirus, that, uh, you know, there was teams like, I think, Columbus and the Islanders and, and a couple other teams that were literally one point out. Yeah, it's fair because they deserve to have a shot at that. It's not perfect, but. You know, I, I think you'll get into a little bit of a pickle if, like, one of those teams, like, if the 24th ranked team, and I don't know who that is, it might, it might be Columbus. If they win at all, you're going to be like, well, they didn't even qualify for the playoffs. Yeah. But it's, 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 it's such I a I think wacky. the Sabres were like half a game out of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, well, the Kings were, uh, well, what sucks for the Kings, uh, in one regard, is they had won seven in a row. Right. But so the the stoppage actually helped them because they were winning too much. Like they had the second worst record in the league, and then they were like blowing their draft pick. Yeah, which sucks. But like, uh, you know, see, we started with a ten game win streak this season back in like October, November, right? Which is like, holy shit, we're gonna win the fucking Stanley Cup yeah. this year. And then they just then they December, January, they just couldn't win a game at all. I mean, it's like, well, in hockey, you're fucked. You, you either want to be really good and competing for the cup or you want to be shitty like yeah. Detroit or Ottawa. You want to tank. Uh, and I think Ottawa has, they have a chance, I believe, unless they're going to change the rules for this year, which where there's a rumor that they were slotted where they might get the first two picks. Mm. Uh, I know the Kings uh, are like third. Uh, you know, they're going to do the lottery, but the Kings right. have a pretty good chance of possibly getting number one because uh, it's that kid Lafreniere who's yeah. uh, supposed to be the real deal, and the Kings could really use him. Hell yeah. Could, Ottawa, Detroit definitely could use him. Yeah. Josh Potter, where can Thanks people so find much, you? Thanks so much, dude. Oh, dude, thank you. First of all, thank you. <clears throat> uh, people can find me on, uh, I'm on Twitter at J underscore Potter. I got Instagram at Josh underscore Potter. And then twitch.tv slash Josh underscore Potter. And uh, tour dates are coming back in the fall. Um, so look on my Twitter for those. I got, the, I got them all rescheduled for the most part. So I got Chicago, fucking Nashville, Alabama, fucking Sacramento, all that shit. So go check those out. Tickets are on sale. Thanks for having me, dude. Dude, it's, uh, I'm sorry it took this long. No, yeah, it's all good, dude. We should go to a hockey game yeah, sometime. Yeah. I'm glad uh, you were wearing a wrestling shirt that day. Uh, Hell yeah, I got one on now. Uh, listen to your mom's uh, house podcast as well. Oh, yeah. Yes, and, please. Uh, Thank you. I don't think they need the help of my, <laughs> yeah. my six listeners, but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, they were nice enough. To, uh, it shows you the power of going on a podcast like that. Right. Like, for me, I picked up, I think, 
a, like 200 followers on Instagram. And, it's amazing, right? I mean, it's crazy it's how fast. Really, uh, and I know like Jesus Strejo just did um, Rogan and he he went from like 4,000 followers or something pretty low to like 50. Yeah, it's nuts. So it's a support all the podcasts because they help us. And uh, Josh is great. So please see him on the road. I'll uh, send out the links to all his stuff. So become a fan of his. He's a wrestling fan, a hockey fan. I mean, wh- what more <laughs> could you want? And uh, we'll be back next week with another guest who people ask me, how do you get on the Inappropriate Earl podcast? I tell them, as long as you have a map quest or a Uber account <laughs> and you can drive to my home, you can be a guest. There you go. Inappropriate Earl. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts, please. Bring it.